Hi, welcome to Ms. Smith's video. I'm going to be looking at Cyclops. Um, basically, I'm going to have it read for us from our little like recording that I have. I'm going to pause it as we go so I can explain things to you just because my voice will get kind of tired. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn that on now. One sec. Okay, there we go. So you can see this. Just to recap for you guys, remember Odysseus has already been at the Trojan War. There we go. It's already been at the Trojan War um, for 10 years. And Ismeros was like technically after the Trojan War, but he hadn't really left on his adventure yet. Um, and so we've already seen the Lotus Eaters, who they had the leaves that people got um, you know, basically addicted to, um, and they forgot about wanting to go home. So that already happened, and now we're on the island of Cyclops. In your books, I'm starting on page 566. We don't necessarily need all of the stuff, but now you can see me there. Um, the thing about Cyclops' island is that it's really where we start to see flaws with Odysseus. Um, we already saw a flaw with Odysseus. You can kind of see my mouth moving. Honest Maris because he said, "Hey man, how about we pack up? We you know we've we pillaged the village. We took some you know food and stuff. We killed some people. Let's leave." And his crewmates say, "No, I don't want to." And really, that kind of reflects poorly on him as a leader because they aren't listening to him. However, we do see a change on Lotus Eaters because when he comes back to the ship and he says, um, "We need to leave right now. Do not eat the leaves, or it will make you lose your hope of home." Like a really important part because you know that's what they want to go home um his crewmates actually listen now the three who had eaten the lotus leaves are a little bit different their mind was altered basically they're on drugs um and so he ties them under the boat so that they can't escape um and that way they can't leave um but then they all row away and they listen to odysseus which is great so now we're on the island of cyclops and we're going to see a little bit of odysseus's problems as like a leader and who he is. And that's kind of what we're doing with our unit is since it's journey, I'm sorry, since the unit is called Journeys of Transformation, we're going to see how Odysseus transforms. And there can be multiple ways that he transforms. So keep up, try and see which ways you notice, and we'll have a discussion about of it um, together. So for Cyclops, I'm on page 566. Basically what happened is he and his men had been sailing on their ship. Um, they were out at sea. They needed food because, you know, you can't carry that much food with you to provide for a long, long time. So they um, were on their boat and sailing and they saw these islands. And this is like, that's some big islands. Let's go. And so like way, way far off. Oh, I don't have my little sheep with me. In the distance, they saw sheep. And he's like, oh, perfect. They got some sheep. We can eat the sheep. It'll be great. So they sail up there and they get there and these sheep are huge, like the size of like bigger than cows that we have, like big sheep. And he was like, whoa, okay. Um, this is a big sheep. Maybe the size of cows, we'll go with cow size. And so then they're looking around the island, they're all big sheep. It's not like an unusual one sheep. So they, now though you look up at the cliff, there's like a huge mountain or whatever. And it's like, wow, look some caves. I wonder what's in those caves. So they go inside the caves and there's um, there's big, huge piles of cheese and piles of whey. Um, and so they start eating like, oh, this is so good. This is perfect. And they're going to take it back to their ship. And the crewmates say, all right, Captain Odysseus, time for us to head back. We got food. We got, you know, we could take a sheep with us if we wanted to, but let's head out. And Odysseus looks at the giant sheep, looks at the caves and says, Nah, I, I got to know who lives here. So basically, he's like, I want to wait and find out who, who lives here. Who, who does this island belong to? So he says, we're going to wait. And he's going to be like, wait, no, please. Like, Odysseus, what if we don't? What if we just leave, please? And he says, no, we're staying here. It'll be great. It doesn't go great. So that's where we're starting on the top of page 566. Odysseus and his men are waiting for whoever lives there to get home, and it's the Cyclops. So now we're gonna start listening. We lit a fire, burnt an offering, and took some cheese to eat, then sat in silence around the embers, waiting. When 
he came, he had a load of dry boughs on his shoulder to stoke his fire at supper time. He dumped it with a great crash into that hollow cave, and we all scattered fast to the far wall. Then over the broad cavern floor, he ushered the ewes he meant to milk. He left his rams and he goats in the yard outside and swung high overhead a slab of solid rock to close the cave. Two dozen four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he wedged it over the door sill. Next. All right. So this is important to note. One, you can look on page 567 and you have a very lovely picture of our very handsome Cyclops. He's quite the looker. Um, but he's huge. And so Odysseus and his men are hiding. And when he comes into the cave, he's got all this wood. He brings his sheep with him. So clearly he's like a shepherd of the Cyclopses. And then in front of the door, he puts this. Hold on. You can see me. Okay. In front of the door of the Cyclops' cave, he puts this huge rock in place. It's huge. It's so heavy that our text says, um, two dozen, so 24, four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the ton under that rock. So 24 wagon teams that has like, you know, multiple horses could not have moved this rock. That's how big it is. You just need to keep that in mind because that is important for us. He took his seat and milked his bleeding ewes. A practice job he made of it, giving each ewe her suckling. Thickened his milk then into curds and whey, sieved out the curds to dip in withy baskets, and poured the whey to stand in bowls, cooling until he drank it for his supper. When all these chores were done, he poked the fire, keeping on brushwood. In the glare, he saw us. Strangers, he said, who are you? And where from? What brings you here by seaways, a fair traffic? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? We felt a pressure on our hearts in dread of that deep rumble and that mighty man. But all the same, I spoke up in reply. We are from Troy, Achaeans, blown off course by shifting gales on the Great South Sea, homeward bound, but taking roots and ways uncommon, so the will of Zeus would have it. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroyed. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help or any gifts you give, as custom is to honor strangers. We would entreat you, great sir, have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. Okay, so an important thing to remember is that with Greek culture, like we already learned, you have to be nice and you have to be kind to guess because it, it could be a test from the gods. We talked about that when we were on King Alcinous's court, and that's why they don't say, who the heck is this guy? They bring him in, they feed him, he gets a feast, and they get him clothes, and they bring a minstrel, and they're like, do you want to hear any songs? And they do everything they can for him before they're like, so who are you? Because you have to be nice to guess, or the gods might punish you. And that's what Odysseus is reminding him here. Also, we see a little bit of his heroic, um, I'm sorry, his epic hero um, pride, because he talks about who they are, because obviously, I don't really blame the Cyclops. You know, if I was at my house, just like, you know, going about getting my dinner ready, taking care of my dog, and I look up and there's just some dudes chilling in my house, I'd say, um, who the heck are you? Why are you here? What are you doing? So I don't really blame the Cyclops for being so abrupt with them. And Odysseus, with his ego, says, we are from Troy, Achaeans, which means Greeks, by the way. And we are of great Achaeans. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid to waste. So, like, he's really full of himself and prideful. And, you know, it, the war literally just ended. So it's been, like, I don't know, a month. Like, it hasn't been that long. And um, so it's very new and relevant information. But come on, dude. He just wants to know why who you are and why you're in his house. Just be nice to him. And so Odysseus does remind him. At line 215, Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. And you can see on your left-hand little side, there's like some notes. Avenge means to get revenge. So he's like, Zeus will have revenge on you if you don't take care of us. And like, that's kind of a lot to say to a stranger. But He answered this from his rude chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, 
or else you come from the other end of nowhere, telling me, mind the gods. We Cyclopes care not a whistle for your thundering Zeus or all the gods in bliss. Which I do love the words of the Cyclops because he says, we care, I'm sorry, you are a ninny and we care not a whistle. So I do think it's very funny and feel free to throw those into your everyday language. But I don't know, I just really like that part of the Cyclops that kind of humanizes them a little bit. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus, you or your friends, unless I had a whim to. Tell me, where was it now you left your ship? Around the point or down the shore, I wonder? He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this and answered with a ready lie. My ship? Poseidon Lord, who sets the earth a tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from seaward served him, drove us there. We are survivors, these good men and I. So obviously the Cyclops asks because the Cyclops is like, well, where's your ship? Because he wants to smash it. And it is he's smart, um, you know, because he also has the goddess Athena on his side, so he has to be a little smarter. And um, he says, oh, no, you know, our ship got destroyed, so we are survivors. So, you know, it's just what we have going on. Um, so we're just survivors. And honestly, at that point, probably people are like, oh, but Cyclops says. Neither reply nor pity came from him. But in one stride, he clutched at my companions and got two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion. Everything. Innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We so, you know, Cyclops has these strangers in his house, and they're not being very nice. And so I hear him there. But then, as he's watching them, he grabs two of the men in his hands, and it's this is our epic simile for the moment, like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, and he eats them, which like, that's an extreme reaction to have someone in your house. But so he catches them in, and he squishes them, and he eats them, and Zeus and his men are just having to watch this. Cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on filling up his belly with man flesh and great gulps of whey, then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along his flank to stab him where the midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So, let's see, hopefully you guys can kind of see me. Oh, there we go. So, Odysseus. Oh, he sees all his men get eaten. I'm sorry, not all of his men, but he sees his men, some of his men get eaten. And the rest of his men and him are like, oh my gosh, this is insane. And so the Cyclops lays down to go to sleep, um, you know, because this is just what he feels like doing. So Odysseus grabs his sword from his side and walks up to the giant sleeping Cyclops. And he's about to poke him in the liver with the sword, which is like right here, which would not go well for anybody because you know, it gets to fall out and you're would bleed out and die but he stops because don't forget we have the gigantic rock way over here that's covering the doorway that 24 teams of wagons could not move that rock so there is no way Odysseus and his men can move it by themselves so they can't kill him they have to wait because otherwise they'll be stuck in the cave and they'll perish so we were left to groan and wait for morning when the young dawn with fingertips of rose lit up the world, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes, all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers. Then, his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through. But he, behind, reset the stone as one would cap a quiver. And I'm just going to talk real briefly that to cap a quiver, you can look over at your little side notes, is to close a case holding arrows. So if you've ever seen like anything that has to do with an archer, um, I always think of Hunger Games. They, archers, if they're in battle, will have like a little thing on their back back here that has arrows in it. So they'll stand there and they'll go, whoosh go, whoosh go, and like keep reloading um, their bow so they can keep shooting arrows. And that's called the quiver. And so <clears throat> he is able to re-close the cave with the giant rock as easy as one recaps a quiver. It's not hard, it's just putting a lid on something. So for the Cyclops, it's as simple as doing this for him. No big deal. 
There was a din of whistling as the Cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground, then stillness. And now I pondered how to hurt him worse, if but Athena granted what I prayed for. Here are the means I thought would serve my turn. A club or staff lay there along the fold, an olive tree felled green and left to season for Cyclops' hand. And it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep sea-going craft might carry. And so long, so big around it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pole and set it down before my men who scraped it. And when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with pointed end. I held this in the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it, then hid it well back in the cavern under one of the dung piles in profusion there. Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in Cyclops's eye when mild sleep had mastered him? As luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss. Four strong men. And I made five as captain. All right. So, a few things of importance for us. First, I'm looking at line 264. You can see they're like little line numbers. Well, 263. And now I pondered how to hurt him worst, if but Athena granted what I prayed for. So basically he's like, please, Athena, help me. I need to figure out how to escape the Cyclops. And remember, she like she thinks Odysseus is precious, like a little puppy. And she's like, oh, little Odysseus. Okay. Yes, Athena adores him. But the other reason why he's asking her is, if you look on your side notes, what kind of goddess is Athena? She's the goddess of wisdom, skills, and warfare. So if you need help, like if you're struggling on our, our Odyssey test, say, Goddess Athena, please help me figure out how to take this test. Help me remember the story of Odysseus because she'll help you with wisdom. Um, next, she gives him a plan. There in the cave, there's this huge like tree laying on the ground that basically the Cyclops is saving so he can turn it into a, um, like a big staff or a club or whatever. So Odysseus takes it and he cuts out a big section, like way bigger than this, way thicker around. Is what I have. So they cut out a huge section. He says, All right, men, help me. So the men help smooth it out so it's not super rough. Then they take a sharp object and boom, they make a point on the end. So now it's pointy. Then Odysseus, is like, we got to make this even better. So there's a fire going. So they take it and they put it into the fire and they let it get real burnt and crisp because it'll be harder and sharper. So now this part's all burned. So they have this big pointy stick and they need to take it and then finally this is like we have to hide this and he puts it under the poo poo pile in the back of the cave which i would never check there so not a bad hiding place so it's hidden in the back under poop um and then he has the men draw lots for who's going to help him blind the cyclops with the stick later that evening came the shepherd with his flock his woolly flock the rams as well this time entered the cave. By some sheep herding whim, or a god's bidding, none were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the bleating ewes in proper order, with the lambs to suck, and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it. And see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would help us home. But you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will any other traveler come to see you? Which, Odysseus, come on now. He is trying to make the Cyclops feel comfortable. So they're like, oh, Cyclops, please try some wine. This will be great. And so he has this bowl. And he's like, you know, we're going to give it to you for an offering. So he's being nice. And like, honestly, if I was the Cyclops, we'd look to a false sense of security. But then it is, he says, but you're a, ba a mad, unbearable, bloody monster. So if you're ever trying to escape someone and trying to convince them that you are good and all this caring stuff, maybe don't call them a mad, unbearable, bloody monster. But so he has this huge bowl of wine. It's like, Cyclops, please try some wine. He seized and drained the bowl. And it went down so fiery and smooth, he called for more. Give me another. Thank you kindly. Tell me. How are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclopes know the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain. But here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him. And he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones. So huge bowls of wine. And this is like probably like really good, really strong wine. And so the Cyclops have had three huge things of wine. And the fuddle and flush comes over him. So like clearly he's turning drunk. And so Odysseus starts like sweet talking him. 
Hopefully this doesn't sink for us. We'll find out. Cyclops, you ask my honorable name? Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is Nobody. Mother, father, and friends, everyone calls me Nobody. Now we know his name's not Nobody, it's Odysseus. But there must be a reason for this plan. So we're going to go along with it. And he said, Nobody's my meat then after I eat his friends. Others come first. There's a noble gift now. In my mind, he's like, Wahaha, there's your noble gift now. Because the gift he's giving Odysseus in exchange for the wine is, I'll eat you last. You can watch all of your friends die and get eaten, and you'll be last. Ha ha ha. And, like, dude, stop being so terrible. It makes me not want to feel bad for you. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward, his great head lolling to one side, and sleep took him like any creature. Drunk, hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of men. So basically, the Cyclops threw up, and like arms and stuff came out of his mouth. Gross. Now, by the gods, I drove my big hand spike deep in the ember, jarring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. The pipe of olive, green though it had been, reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals, and my four fellows gave me a hand, lugging it near the Cyclops as more than natural force nerved them. Straight forward, they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye, and leaned on it, turning it as a shipwright turns a drill in planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove. So with our brand, we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the red hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared. The pierced ball hissed broiling and the roots popped. All right, so I've got a few things to talk about. There we go. So Odysseus, now that the Cyclops is asleep, laying down, Odysseus and his men go get the stick again that they've already sharpened and they've already, you know, hardened it with the fire. And so now they put it back in the fire and they get it nice and hot and glowing. And they like huge, like it takes five guys to help carry this thing huge over to the head of the Cyclops. And they hold it over his eye and go <sighs> down to his eye. Obviously, it's going to hurt. Obviously, the Cyclops, who only has one eye, is now blinded. And so um, I'm looking at line like 330. Uh, I'm sorry, 334, and leaned on it, turning as a shipwright term, tums a drill and planking, having men below to swing the two-handle strap that spins in the groove. So not only is it plunged into the eye of the Cyclops, epic simile alert, they are turning it in his eye, and it's so huge they're having to work together to turn it, and the epic simile is comparing how they're turning this in the eye of the Cyclops to how on a ship, which I'm not great with ship stuff, but we'll be fine, I always picture like when you're trying to take an anchor up on like an old-fashioned ship, not using power, there was a huge like turning thing that had sticks poking out of it. So every guy would grab a stick and push it in a circle so that way they could pull up the anchor. And so that's what it's comparing this to is they're turning it with such force and purpose like when people are trying to get the ship going and so they have to pull up the anchor. That's what I got. Oh, and now we have another one. Ready? In a smithy, one sees a white hot axe head or an adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam, the way they make soft iron hail and hard. Just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. So this is a different epic simile. In a smithy, one sees a white hot axe head or an adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam, the way they make soft iron hail hard, just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. Um, so I don't know if you guys have ever been to like a battle place or um, like a bunker for one of the wars. And they'll have people there who are like blacksmiths and people who are showing different skills. When you're a blacksmith, obviously you have to form different metal shapes and stuff. So you get it nice and hot because that way it's, you know, more of like a liquid state. So you can bend it and mold it. And so they beat it. And in this case, we're talking about an ax head. So you beat the ax head. So it's nice and has the shape you need but it's still liquidy, so you need to cool it down really fast. So they always plunge it into a bucket of water. And because the iron is so hot and the water is so cold, it goes and all the steam comes out. That's the exact sound that the Cyclops' eyeball made when they put the very hot spike inside of it. Delicious. The Cyclops bellowed and the rock roared around it and we fell back in fear. Clawing his face, he tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away. And his wild hands went grooving. Which I always tell the story, and I'll just do it briefly. Um, if you ever get a stick in your eye, don't pull it out. Um, when I 
was growing up, a kid in a neighborhood put a stick into his eye, playing with his friends there, joking around and messing around, like playing swords. And he went inside with the stick in his eye. He's like, mom, mom, I need help. And so she came down the stairs and as she comes down the stairs, she watches him go and pull the stick out of the eye and like blood and everything, but you can't pull it out because it'll damage your eye more. So life tip. Then he set up a howl for Cyclopes who lived in caves on Windy Peaks nearby. Some heard him, and they came by divers' ways to clump around outside and called, What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? You will not let us sleep. Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you. So now we have our Cyclops' name. It's Polyphemus. And um, now we know who he is. And so he's calling for the other Cyclops to help. And it's the middle of the night. They're not happy about being woken up. I sure wasn't happy when I was woken up by storms the other day. So they're like, what do you need? What do you want? Surely no one's bothering you right now. And so Polyphemus, our Cyclops, replies. Ruined you? Out of the cave, the mammoth Polyphemus roared in answer. Nobody. Nobody's tricked me. Nobody's ruined me. So now we understand why Odysseus said his name was Nobody. Because everybody's outside like, all right, what do you need, Polyphemus? Why are you crying so? And Polyphemus says, nobody, nobody's tricked me. Nobody's ruined me. And they're like, okay, so if nobody's tricked you, what's the problem? To this rough shout, they made a sage reply. Oh, well, if nobody has played you foul there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. No, oh, wait. So saying, they trailed away. All right, so. Basically, the Cyclopses, um, they're a pretty brute breed, apparently, because of what they say. Um, so clearly, he's crying out for something, but they don't know who it is because he says it's nobody. And so they say, ah, if nobody's played you foul there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lore, to whom you pray. So their insult basically is, well, you're lonely, so that's probably why you cry. Go cry to your daddy. And who is Polyphemus' dad? This is important for us. It's Poseidon. So definitely make that notes in your timeline that you're still doing. So that way you can remember big detail, Cyclops' dad, Poseidon. And I was filled with laughter to see how like a charm the name deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great doorstone and squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted, hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life, until a trick came, and it pleased me well. The Cyclops' rams were handsome, fat, with heavy fleeces, a dark violet. Three abreast, I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielded left and right. So three sheep could convey each man. I took the woolliest ram, the choicest of the flock, and hung myself under his kinky belly, pulled up tight, with fingers twisted deep in sheepskin ringlets for an iron grip. So, breathing hard, we waited until morning. All right, so. Let me see if I have it. Yes, I do. Okay, so uh, normally I would have you guys here to help me out with this, but I don't. So we're making do, and it's going to be great. So here's what I've got. We're dealing with it. Perfect. Alright, so Odysseus, his plan is his men are all stuck, they need to get out. Cyclops is blinded, but he's standing, he's opened the door, the stone's moved, and Cyclops is standing in front of the door going like this, to go, rah. Because he's hoping people will like, you know, try and escape around his legs or whatever, and he can go and kill them. So Odysseus says, no, we're gonna wait. He makes a plan. For each man. He has three sheep. Here are my sheep. Bah. So for each man, he ties three sheep together so they're like this. And underneath, he puts, he like ties a man to the belly of the middle one. 
So they're like chilling right here. Three sheep together. So that way, when the sheep try and leave to go out the door, don't fall sheep. And the cyclops is blind, he can go like this, but he's not going to find the men. So they make him escape. So that works out. And then Odysseus, he's by himself. He doesn't have anyone to tie him. So he says, remember this is him telling his story, oh, I'm so strong, I'm so great, I took the wooliest, fleeciest limb, and I just, I clung to him all night, which I know he's an epic hero, but to have the strength to, with your fingers and your toes, grip onto the underside of a sheep for the entire evening seems a little far-fetched. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying, wow. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture. And peals of bleeding echoed round the pens where dams with others full called for a milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stroked each ram, then let it pass. But my men, riding on the pectoral fleece, the giant's blind hands blundering never found. Last of them all, my ram, the leader, came, weighted by wool and me with my meditations. The cyclops patted him. And then he said, Sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all, and go afar to crop sweet grass, and take your stately way leading along the streams, until at evening you run to be the first one in the fold. Why now so far behind? So, also, just so you know, importantly, that it's all rams, so the none of the sheep that are under that have um, his men under them got milked. Um, and also, you can see in our picture on page 572 just how big the sheep are. That's the cyclops. That's the sheep, the biggest sheep, but still a sheep. And there's Odysseus down there. So you can see they're pretty massive as far as sheep go. And so all the other men's sheep are already outside. And Odysseus's last one is waiting. And Cyclops says, oh, cousin Ram, why are you lagging behind? Why you wait? Normally, you go out first and you eat the most. And then you run back and come back with everyone else. But you always go first. Why so far behind now? And honestly, if I was Odysseus underneath, I'd be like, oh, sh I don't, uh, uh, is he going to think? Is he going to catch on to me? No, because it's almost sweet. Can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companions burned it out when he had conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell where he may be now dodging all my fury. Bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock wall, his brains would strew the floor. And I should have rest from the outrage nobody worked upon me. So it's kind of sweet, but he's like, oh, sweet Ram, why you lag behind the rest? Because remember, he's blind. You normally go out so fast. Is it because you're grieving for your master and the loss of my eye? Well, <laughs> and like, I mean, to be fair, I probably would have had that conversation with like my pet if something happened, but it's almost sweet. But still, he did murder a bunch of people and eat them, so. He sent us into the open then. Close by, I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly, going this way and that to untie the men. With many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take aboard and drove them down to where the good ship lay. We saw, as we came near, our fellows' faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, tallying those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking head and eyebrows up, and in a low voice told them, Load this herd, move fast, and put the ship's head toward the breakers. They all pitched in at loading, then embarked and struck their oars into the sea. So they're successful. Odysseus and his men get out, the ones who weren't eaten, because um, the Cyclops let them out. And the second that they get free from the Cyclops' cave, they're out of the door. Odysseus, who was clinging to his sheep, drops from the sheep and like goes to untie all his men, and they start going towards the ship. Now, to add insult to injury, they've already escaped the Cyclops, that's what they wanted. They also take some of his sheep with them. It says they take the stiff legged sheep aboard, which, whatever. So they run down shore, they see all the men, and some of the guys, you know, they said, oh, you guys made it. But then they see who's not there, and they're like, oh my gosh, we lost people. And just like, he's very direct. And like, this does make him a good leader, I think. When he says, load this herd, move fast and put the ship's head toward the breakers. And so they all pitch in loading because they can see from him, this is serious. So they start loading the, bo the boat. 
Now they've got the boat and they are pressing out. Like they are on the boat. They have most of his men. They have food. They are good to go. But our epic hero has excessive pride. So this is not the last thing. We know it. Far out, as far offshore as shouted words would carry, I sent a few back to the adversary. Oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands? How do you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal? Eater of guests under your roof, Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing in his double fury broke a hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Ahead of our black prow it struck and sank, whelmed in a spewing geyser. A giant wave that washed the ship stern foremost back to shore. All right, so, oh wait, I'll let it finish. I got the longest boat hook out and stood fending us off with furious nods to all to put their backs into a racing stroke, row, row, or perish. So the long oars bent, kicking the foam sternward, making head until we drew away and twice as far. Okay, so they are on the boat. Moving this, taking it with me. Okay. They are on their boat. And so all his men and all of him and all the sheep are sailing away from that Cyclops' island. They're sailing out to sea. They are like halfway from Cyclops' island, like from like, you know, distance wise. So they're far enough away. And Odysseus turns back and shouts back towards the Cyclops, Cyclops, do you like the beating we gave you? And he justifies it by saying, Zeus has repaid you for like being mean to your guests. Which is a lie, but like he's like, oh, we did this because you should be punished by the gods, and we told you Zeus would punish you if you didn't take care of your guests, which is us. So, Cyclops is my boat, is furious, understandably. And so he's like, ah! So he takes, oh, I don't have anything, a hilltop in his hands, he just breaks off side of the mountain and throws it at the boat. He's blind, he can't see it, but he can hear them. So he throws at the boat, and the rock goes, whoosh, 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 and lands just in front of the boat. So they're trying to sail away, which they didn't die, which is great, but it's so big, it creates such a big wave, it pushes the boat back towards shore. Everyone's like, oh shoot, Captain, why'd you do that? So he grabs a, like a hook and an oar, and everyone's like, row, row, or perish. So they're, they're going all the way up. Now, they're twice as far away as they were. And Odysseus turns around again to say some more stuff, because he's too prideful. Now, when I cupped my hands, I heard the crew in low voices protesting. God's sake, Captain, why bait the beast again? Let him alone. That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beats us. All but stove us in. Give him our bearing with your trumpeting. He'll get the range and lob a boulder. Aye, he'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit, but let my anger flare. And so, as he is there twice as far now, this is my boat, and they're on their boat, Odysseus turns back again, and his crewmates say, Captain, please, why are you going to bait the beast again? Why would you do this again? He's going to do it again. He's going to hear us. He's going to know where we are better, and he's going to try again. He's going to capsize our boat. We're going to die. We're escaped. We've got food. Please don't aggravate the Cyclops. And does he lessen? He does not, because he has excessive pride. Go find out what that word is. It's probably important for us. So he has excessive pride. And he turns back to the Cyclops and yells. Oh, yells. Oh, Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell him Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye. Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. At this he gave a mighty saw and rumbled, now comes the weird upon me spoken of. All right, pause. So here's the thing. Because remember, Cyclops did not know Odysseus' real name. He thought he was nobody. But he's not nobody. So, Odysseus turned out like, if anyone ever asks who blinded you, tell them it was me, Odysseus, son of Laertes, of Ithaca, where I live. So not only has he told him his name, where he lives, and in case there's another Odysseus running around Ithaca, he's like, son of Laertes, just in case. Which... Dude, come on. So he says all of these things, which like, you know, even five-year-olds learn. Your parents are saying, now if somebody's asking you where you're from or who you are, 
don't listen, don't tell him your name, and don't tell him where you live, because that's to be safe. And this grown man who's won wars doesn't know that. A wizard brand. Oh, sorry. And so then this makes the Cyclops, so we got to see us. Cyclops is so pleased. No, he says, now the weird comes upon me. So he's going to tell us about a prophecy he heard a long time ago. The wondrous Nadir, tell us, a son wizard. of Uranus. Great length of days he had in wizardry among the Cyclopes, and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost, and at Odysseus's hands. Always I had in mind some giant, armed in giant force, would come against me here. But this, but you, you. small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine. You blinded me. Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of Earthquake to befriend you. His son. Oh. Son I am. For he, by his avowal, fathered me. So, he's like, I was prophesied that this guy named Odysseus would blind me, but I thought he'd be some big dude. But this, but you, you blinded me? You're so puny. How could this even happen? And then he tries to play a trick of his own. He says, Odysseus, come back, and um, I'll have my father befriend you. Don't forget, his father, who is god of earthquakes, Poseidon, will help you. This is a lie. He's trying to get it back so we can go and squish him. But um, he says, come back and I can help you make him be your friend. Because again, we're being told that Poseidon's his father. So this is really important. If he will, he may heal me of this black wound. He and no other of all the happy gods or mortal men. A few words I shouted in reply to him. So like, yes, this is a trick. But Odysseus takes it a little too far, and he says, If I could take your life, I would, and take your time away, and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquake could not heal you there. Which, I mean, just, just stop talking to him, honestly. But he's like, if I could, I would send you to hell, and then your father couldn't help you there. <clears throat> what the fuck? This, he stretched his hands out in the darkness toward the sky of stars, and prayed Poseidon. Oh, hear me, Lord, blue girdler of the islands, if I am thine indeed and thou art father, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, never see his home. Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca. Should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family and his fatherland, far be that day, and dark the years between. Let him lose all companions and return under strange sail to bitter days at home. So... He says, the Cyclops says, Father, if you really are my father, help me and make it almost impossible for Odysseus to come home. If he does have to come home, like if Destiny says he has to, um, far be that day and dark the years between and kill all of his men. So Odysseus will have all of his men lost. It'll take a really long time to get home. And he has to come home on strange sail. So... That's why when we're on Calypso's Island, like, you know, before this, well, actually, I don't know. Hold on. Because remember, timelines are weird for me and for us for this story. But up. So we're here, but we've already read the Calypso part. Remember when he left Calypso's Island and went to King Alcinous's court? And Calypso's like, I promise to help you. And she gives him a raft. And so he's on the raft sailing away and the storms come up and it destroys his raft. That is because on Cyclops Island, sorry, Odysseus um, gets cursed basically because the Cyclops prays for Poseidon to make his life really hard. So while we're still like, you know, maybe like a month out of the Trojan War, it takes like nine and a half more years for him to get home because of the Cyclops' wish. Which, that's almost impressive. In these words he prayed, and the god heard him. Now he laid hands upon a bigger stone and wheeled around, titanic for the cast, to let it fly in the black proud vessel's track. But it fell short, just after the steering oar, and whelming seas rose giant above the stone to bear us onward toward the island. Okay, so, Odysseus, several of those things on his boat. And the Cyclops says that prayer, and he's like, please curse the Odysseus, make it impossible for him to get home. And to, you know, one last try, blind Cyclops takes another mountaintop and throws it at the boat, but we're farther away. So this time on the boat, 
the rock lands behind them, not on them, but behind them, and it pushes them out, and they're gone. And like that's the end of our Cyclops story. I know this was really long. I'm so sorry, guys, but they'll be shorter now. And it was really important for us because we learned lots of important information. So in our packets, identify how Greek values and culture were demonstrated for us. That's super important because Odysseus and his men are not treated properly as guests. Let me grab my other packet. I'll be right back. Write down your summaries. Oh no! What am I to do? Okay, perfect. Sorry. So, how does the disease introduce? How does Odysseus and his men introduce themselves? So Odysseus doesn't even introduce himself with his real name. He's just like, we are Achaeans, and he brags about himself because he's prideful. So what does, oh, and then he also says, don't forget you have to be nice to us because we are guests, and Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. So what does this indicate about Greek culture values? There we go, sorry. It's because you have to be nice to your guests. Uh, when Odysseus is, is sailing away, he explains not only his name, where he lives, and who his father is, just in case. Because he wants to get credit for blinding the Cyclops. But it comes back to bite in the butt in a big way. And then finally, I ask you about epic simile. We saw three, but I'd like you to either focus on the one about um, turning the stick, the giant, huge club stick, and the sound of the eye popping and the hissing. So find those. I think they're both on page 570. Pick out one of them and just write for me and say like on, on these lines, so tell me what lines they are, this is being compared to this. Um, and once you have your summary, you'll be good to go for this island. I hope you guys enjoyed it and it'll be great. Bye guys.